One other reason, just to interrupt for the recording, is there were several uh, people from church who couldn't be here tonight yeah. and asked if we could record it. So it is not so that you will be uh, on tape personally and uh, or anything else like that. It's just so that we don't have to go through and, and right. do this and repeat this. That's right. And the other thing to say in terms of questions, I'm interruptible. So feel free to interrupt me with questions. Although I think for the term, for the first part of the talk, it's probably best if the questions are questions of clarification only, when you don't understand the material that's being presented. I'm sure that some of the things I'm going to say are going to raise issues that you may want to discuss right then and there, but we will have that time at the end to come back and circle back and deal with things in terms of hashing it out. So feel free to interrupt with questions, but request that they be questions of content clarity and not, you know. If the problem is, is otherwise we'll we'll we'll, ne we'll get past never get past the third slide if we if we don't do that. Okay, so the question that I'd like to pose tonight is this one: Is can an evangelical Christian accept evolution? That's the, the sort of the purpose of the talk. In terms of an outline for where we're going tonight, please work. Why are you not working? Oh, good. All right. So in terms of where we're going tonight, this is what I'd like to do. Briefly talk about how science works. Science is a way of knowing, but it's not the only way of knowing. So we're going to briefly discuss how science works, what its sphere of influence is, and how what its sort of scope um, is. Then we'll move on to look, as I said before, to look at what the Genome Project has to say in terms of this question of human evolution. And the key question that we'll be addressing here is whether or not humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor. Common ancestry, this is, chimpanzees are based on other criteria. They are proposed to be the closest living evolutionary relatives of humans. Now there are other species that are proposed to have been more closely to, related to humans in the past, but those species are no longer with us. They've gone extinct. So in terms of living organisms, chimps based on anatomy and physiology and, and morphology are predicted to be our closest living ancestors. Now that we've completed the Human Genome Project, and also, you may not be aware, we've also done the Complete Genome Project of chimpanzees, we now have the tools to directly compare these two genomes one to another and ask questions of whether or not there is evolutionary evidence for common ancestry. Then, having thoroughly uh, <laughs> dismayed you with that material, we'll move on to talk about what, we, what sense we can make of this evidence in terms of how we address the opening chapters of Scripture. So that's the, the intent for tonight. Okay, so science as a way of knowing its scope, its range of influence. Okay, so just some common uh, misconceptions. We'll just sort of do this as a ground clearing exercise to get some terms on the table so that we know what we're talking about. The first one is theory. Theory in terms of how it's used in common language is different than how it's used in science. In science, a theory is a well-tested explanatory framework that has not yet been falsified by experimentation. So essentially what it is, is a theory is not the opposite of a fact. A theory is an, an explanatory framework for how a certain process works. And when we say it has not yet been falsified by experimentation, what we mean is that a theory allows you to predict how certain experiments should turn out. So a theory has predictive power. It allows you to set up and say, OK, if this is really the way things are, then this should be the case. And then you can go test it. Theories in science are often revised and improved as new data is discovered. So there is, there, sorry, there isn't this sense that theories are these sort of bedrock, immovable, thing, immovable things in science. They are flexible, they can change as new data is discovered. And if enough evidence is accumulated that does not fit a current theory, it is possible to overthrow them and to replace them. One example that you may know of is um, back in the 1600s, the current model of how the solar system was arranged was overthrown. Prior to about the 1600s, the dominant view was that the Earth was at the center of our solar system, and there was a geocentric model of solar system mechanics. 
accumulating lines of evidence eventually overthrew that with a heliocentric model that puts the sun at the center of our solar system and the planets going around. So given the weight of evidence, theories can indeed be overturned. Okay. On the other hand, some theories in science are so well tested and so well established that it is very unlikely that new data will significantly modify their core uh, principles. So that one that I just used as an example, heliocentrism, isn't going, any, going away anytime soon. It's still only a theory in the scientific sense. Many, many lines of evidence support heliocentrism, especially over and against geocentrism. But it's an explanatory framework that we haven't disproven yet. And actually, heliocentrism is not strictly true. Now that we know Einstein's relativity and the continuity of space-time and you know, things in physics that I am not fully capable of explaining because I don't fully understand them, the original model of heliocentrism was that the sun was the center of our, sort of the galaxy or the universe. Well, we know that that's not the case now. So additional lines of evidence have moved us on from Galileo's heliocentrism to now. Okay. Now, there's sometimes some confusion about what a law is in science. There's sometimes a perception that theories, once they are solid enough, that theories graduate and become laws. Laws and theories are different entities in science. What a law is, a scientific law is a precise relationship between sort of action and reaction. Often there's a mathematical equation involved. So one example would be the law of gravitation. The law of gravitation allows you to calculate, given known masses and given a known distance of separation, one can use that law to calculate the force of gravity that's exerted between the two objects. That's different than the theory of gravitation. Gravi gravitation is still a theory. It's an explanatory framework for how two objects exert force on one another at a distance. And what's interesting is in physics, we still don't have a very good handle on how that works. We don't yet know exactly how two objects at a large distance are able to exert force on one another through space-time. It's part of the theory of gravitation. So there's a law component to gravitation that describes a precise relationship. But then there's also the theoretical component, the explanatory framework for why things are the way that, why they are the way they appear. But th theory and law are different entities. Okay, so theories don't get promoted into the laws, they're different entities. How we normally use the term theory in English is closer to the scientific term hypothesis. A hypothesis is a proposed explanation <clears throat> that makes a prediction that you can test. So in terms of you know, you say, well, that's your theory. What they really should be saying is, well, that's your hypothesis. Now, how would you test it to see if it's actually...